Fascinating. Fascinating. Good morning, Chapel family. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you here. Good morning. Hope you're all having a great Christmas time, season, shopping excursion. I've been seeing lots of pictures. Has anyone been stuck in long lines wrapping around buildings? Okay, let me ask you a different question that's more relatable to most of us. How many of you have gone more than two days without receiving an Amazon package? And it, wow. Okay. So how many of you get an Amazon package nearly every day? Oh, man. Nearly every day? Just you. You guys know Amazon package. Are they for you? They're not for you. Are they for them? All of them? 100%? Okay. How many of you have no idea what you're getting for, for Christmas? How many of you already know every single item you're getting for Christmas? How many of you have a teenager that puts items in your Amazon cart and says, I picked all of my gifts for Christmas? It's ridiculous. How, oh, I didn't say spouse. Your spouse did that? This is what I want for Christmas? It's kind of wild. You guys, Christmas is changing. Christmas is changing, and Brett doesn't like it. What, do you, what would you prefer, Brett, for Christmas? Surprise? Surprise? Surprise. So you don't know what you're getting, though, right? We're not, I don't, there's no marriage therapy during December. I'm just letting you know straight up. Uh, so she told you, but maybe, maybe that was like a decoy, a red herring. Maybe she really got you a 69 RS Camaro. No? Maybe she got you exactly what she told you she was getting you. Okay, what do you guys, how about you guys online? Just want to make sure we're including you too. Someone said that they're having a the winter wonderland, and I asked a question, I don't know if you answered it. How much snow do you have? For those of you who are here from out of state, Annette, how much snow do you have up there? I don't even know what the snow levels are like in the middle of the, the country. I'm guessing that Damon's got some snow in Tenasty. I'm 100% sure that the, uh, and Eric, you've got to have snow in Colorado, right? Colorado Springs snows a lot? Yeah. yeah. Omaha, Nebraska snows a lot? No, maybe. They just have corn. Well, anyhow, uh, glad that you guys are here. If you're just now joining us, we are starting a new mini-series uh, for Christmas, for Advent, and it's all about hope. Uh, hope is something that I've been thinking about. Hope is something that I have often longed for. Today we're going to have an overview of hope, and we're going to be looking at hope from a few different passages in the Bible, uh, one of them being Hebrews chapter 6. So if you want to go forward in your Bible somewhere, but we are going to be reading from other places, hope is something that we cannot live without. And if you know someone, if you're online or if you're here and you're thinking, man, I know someone who needs hope right now, it may be you, it may be someone else. And it might be hope for some miracle that you're waiting on God for. It might be hope for a job. It might be hope for a promotion. It might be hope for, for something to do with your health. It might just be hope to get through today with the things that are going on in your own mind that no one else can see. Hope is a very, very important theme in the Bible. And obviously, with Christmas coming, hope is wrapped up in the person of Jesus being born. So today we're going to look at hope. Uh, we're going to examine it and ask ourselves about the type of hope we have and who we put our hope in. And we're going to look at why, why I believe this world is dying of thirst for hope. So as we, uh, as we begin to sing these songs, I'm going to invite the worship team up. We've got some Christmas songs this week, some Christmas songs. I love singing Christmas songs. They're, I don't like Christmas as a holiday. It's a weird holiday to me. I don't like setting up allergies in my living room. I think that's odd, um, but we do it every year. Uh, this year, someone else put my Christmas lights up for me, which I was grateful for because I've only put them up on the second story once, and I told my wife I'll never do that again. And so we, we had someone put them up for us. It was my brother-in-law. So I was like, if he falls, I mean, he'll live. He's sturdy. Uh, so now we have Christmas lights. We have allergies in the living room. I got eggnog in the fridge. I'm the only person in my household of 11 people that drinks eggnog. I don't understand what's wrong with the rest of these people. And now, this is the first morning we get to, I get to sing Christmas songs with my, my chapel family. Who's leading these songs? Who's leading the Christmassy songs? All of you? The peoples? You guys? The teenagers? Teenagers? Okay, I'm going to pray for you specifically. Father, I thank you 
for this group of people up here who are going to lead us in singing to you with these songs that we know. But, Lord, I pray that we just don't default like I can default, Lord. I, we know these lyrics so many times that maybe we just don't think about what they actually mean. So help us to think about what they mean. Help us to remember what this meant, that you, God, became flesh, that you would cram all of your godness into an infant. It's remarkable. So bless these singers as they sing, Lord, and, and bless us out in the congregation as their backup choir. Help us to sing joyfully, to worship you, to give you the glory and the praise that is due to your name that you deserve, Lord. And help us this morning when we leave this place to have more hope than we did when we walked in. In Jesus' name, all God's kids said, amen. amen. All right, good morning. Would you please stand with us?
Well, we are so happy you are here this morning. This is a beautiful, beautiful, glorious day. Amen to that. As we enter into this beautiful season, uh, no matter how you feel about celebrating Christmas, whether you're one that just wants to focus on um, presents or you're one that wants to focus on not giving presents, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we get to fix our eyes today on Jesus. Amen. We get to fix our eyes today on the greatest gift that was ever given. And this next song is, is based on a, a a very common, well-known Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And when we think about what was it like, what was it like on that first night when the angels filled the sky? I mean, think about this. They filled the sky. I didn't say they just filled their part of the sky, okay? They said they filled the sky. So imagine the angels, just the lights. And the first thing they say is, don't be afraid, because, I mean, they're scary. I mean, come on. It's dark, and there's stars, and all of a sudden, there's these, these angels. But they came to proclaim the truth that the Messiah was born, the one that was going to save us from ourselves was born. Can we get excited about that this morning? Because he wasn't just born a baby. He didn't say a baby. Can I get an amen for that? He grew up. He became a man, and he did not sin. And then he died after showing us what it meant to walk the truth, okay? I get excited about this because this is, this is our truth. This is the truth, that Jesus came from his place of glory to this place of gory to rewrite our story. And no, I'm not going to start waxing poetically here just kind of happened. But the truth is, he did that for us. He did that for you, Cassie. He did that for you, Chassie. He did that for you, Amanda. He did that for all of us. And I believe that if I had been the only one, he would have still done it. I believe that in my heart of hearts, that he loves me that much. So as we sing these last two songs this morning, the Christmas songs, my prayer is that we can all enter into the presence of the Most High and rejoice together because he is glorious, ergo again, and victorious. Amen? All right, here we go.
Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Grab a seat. Grab a seat. I wanted to invite up one of my buddies today. I didn't know that he was going to come here today. As soon as he walked up, I said, will you come share what you're thankful for in 2020? Mr. The Right Reverend Edwin Newman, who we've been praying for. Yeah, we prayed. We prayed for Edwin. For those of you who don't know Edwin, we like him. We want to keep him around with us for a smidgen here. What are you thankful for in 2020, my man? I mean, okay, well, let's, for, if you don't know Edwin, we've been praying for Edwin. 
Because Edwin was in the ICU for how many days? Uh, I need a mask on next to Edwin, actually, come to think of it. I'm not contagious anymore. I don't know. Uh, what if I am? Nah. Antibodies work. Okay. So does prayer. I, oh, yeah. That's what you're thankful for? No, I'm actually thankful for Jesus. Okay. I figured you would give a Jesus answer. I, I, I mean, that's who I am. That's yeah. who it's all about. Um, 2020 has been a challenge, to say the least. Um, but more so in the last 30 to 45 days, uh, in my experience. Um, but I am standing here because... God is faithful. God's people pray. And there is power in prayer. As long as you're praying before the throne of God, whatever is on your heart that causes you to moan and cry out and seek God's face, know, know in the deepest part of your knower that God hears you and answers you. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. Period. No ifs, no buts, no whys, no becauses, no could be, would be, should be. He does. Period. And I'm thankful for Jesus. Amen. Let's go home. Let's go home. That's just, that's it. We're done. I knew you were thinking that. I felt that Derek was like, that's all I need for the day. That may be. Great. Well, now you get to listen to a crappier sermon after that amazing one. <laughs> Jesus, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that Edwin is here with us. I thank you that, I thank you that he came through the coronavirus COVID ICU. I thank, I'm thankful that his wife is on the men and recovering. I'm thankful that Miss Doreen is on the men and recovering. I'm thankful that Howie and Jessica are on the men and recovering. I'm thankful that Bitsy is recovering on the men. Lord, I thank you that my sister-in-law is on the men and recovering. I thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign over disease, that you are sovereign over pain. And I pray this morning as we look at hope and what hope is this Christmas, that you would help those who feel hopeless those who feel hopeless because of their, their attitudes or ideas about where our country is or isn't. Those who feel hopeless about a relationship in their life, whether it's with a spouse or a child or a neighbor or a boss or an employee. Those who feel hopeless about uh, whether or not they're going to have enough to, to buy food, to pay rent, to pay mortgage, to get their kids a gift that they want to get them. Lord, those who feel hopeless just to get up in the morning because they have nothing that is driving them. Those who feel hopeless, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them. I pray that you'd speak to me this morning in Jesus' name. All God's kids said, amen. Hope. Hope is a powerful, powerful, powerful aspect of humanity. It has been said that you can live for weeks without food, some of us more weeks than others, you can live for days without water, you could live for minutes without oxygen. I just watched a YouTube video of a guy training to hold his breath longer. But people have said, and studies have been examining, that what, what hopelessness does to a person, to any living thing really. In 1965, a doctor discovered that hopelessness is learned. He found out that when animals are subjected to difficult situations, they just become passive and give up. They give up their will to live. Now, for this morning, I want to make sure that we're defining hope clearly. Hope is to wish for a particular event that one considers possible, or hope is to have confidence or trust in something else or oneself. It is often associated with trust. Desmond Tutu, an uh, Anglican bishop in South Africa, said, Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. And the reason I want to talk about hope this morning is because as I have navigated this year with you and you with me, I've felt this sense of hopelessness just rising. There's been this idea that, like, there, that our hope is in something less than Jesus, and it terrifies me. And now that it's mostly done, 
depending on how you want to debate or argue with me, hope is not in whoever is going to be in the White House. I've said this a million times. Hope is on the throne that oversees the White House and every other leadership office in the world. But what, what I see happening across the board, suicide increasing, depression increasing, anxiety increasing, these things are symptoms of hopelessness. When I Googled, I feel hope, and I let the Google populate the, the results of that, I feel hope hopeful about my future was only one positive response that was brought in by Google. The rest of them said, I feel hope and added less. I feel hopeless and alone. I feel hopeless about the future. I feel hopeless and depressed. I feel hopeless in my relationship. I feel hopeless about my future. I feel hopeless in my marriage. Every other one except for that one when I did this Google search this week filled in the word hope with less, hopeless. So I want us to have hope and figure out why in the world we don't have hope. I got a dad joke for you. No one's going to get it, probably. Dang it. Okay, the shortest man in the Bible. The shortest man in the Bible, who is? You're incorrect. This is a quote from one of Job's buster friends. He's the shortest man in the Bible. His name is Bildad the Shoe Height. Get it? I guess so. That's a moaner. <laughs> He said the same thing happens to all who forget God. The hopes of the godless evaporate. He's saying if you're apart from God, you're going to begin to lose hope. You see, hope is not a good thing in and of itself. It's what you're putting your hope and trust in. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul tells us, At that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise. At that time, when you were apart from God, he goes on to say, you were without hope and without God in the world. We have this funny thing that my father-in-law and I do at Band of Brothers. If you, if you want to come to Band of Brothers, I encourage you to come out to that. Just not too many, because we, we like our group to be enough to talk in our circles. The men's group that meets at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning at Foundation Coffee. And so I don't get in trouble. There's a women's group that meets here on Saturday morning at 10.30, right? 10, 10. Sorry, I don't go to that group for obvious biological reasons. And my father-in-law have this thing, because we're from different generations. What generation are you technically, Charlie? Or, is that a boomer? Oh, okay, boomer. No? What is the 30s? You're older than a baby boomer? Are you a builder? Are you in the same generation as Henry Ford? Ah. Okay, I think he's a boomer. He's, you're, you're born in what, the 40s? 43. So he's, do you know that there's a whole joke with young people now calling people boomers when they're just cantankerous older people? It's, I know it's dead, but there was a joke. Sorry, the 12-year-old has corrected my, my modern cultural phenomena. No cap, all sus, whatever, okay? Uh, I'm a Gen Xer, and he'll say things, and I've, I've been a believer for 20 years, give or take a little bit more. Now, Charlie, you've been a believer for how long? 69 years. So here's how it goes at Band of Brothers, and I love this. He'll say something like, back in my day, this is what it was like. It was a better time maybe in some ways and a worse time in others. And I, I always tend to agree with him, but I have this go-to move because there's this cover of Time magazine, and it was back in the 40s, 50s, and for anyone that says, we want to go back to the way things were, back to the way things were, and I need to dig it up. It's in some of my documents saved somewhere. It's the cover of Time magazine, and the premier article of this particular issue was Husbands, How to Properly Spank Your Wives. And this was before, like, Fifty Shades of Anything came out, okay? This is talking about discipline. And I think, yeah, it must have been a better era. If that's what the Time magazine cover had on it. See, each generation has its ways that we fall from God, but there is, I think, a very distinct running from who God is and what God said in our culture, and in order to summarize it as best as I could, I just went to one of the masters of, of words, uh, a pastor named Rick Warren from the West Coast, to look at why we have no hope, we have to look at what it means to forget God. In the words of Bill Dad the Shoe Height, 
the hopes of the people who are godless evaporate. If you don't have God in your life, you will be without hope. You will have some hope in some things, but those things will let you down. So this, this is why I believe we have hopelessness on the rise. This is why I believe suicide is on the rise. This is why I believe uh, depression and anxiety are on the rise. This is why I believe that there are crystal clear things about biology that we are openly saying, I don't think that that necessarily has to be the way it exists. And we're getting rid of right and wrong, truth and falsehood. And Pastor Rick says, this is what happens. You want to know what happens when a culture forgets God? Wealth is idolized. Truth is minimized. Life is trivialized. Abortion is legalized. Television is vulgarized. Advertising is sensualized. Everything is sexualized and commercialized. Our conscience has been desensitized and anesthetized. Education is secularized. Free markets are monopolized. Race and politics are polarized. Sports are scandalized. Moral and ethics are liberalized. In entertainment, crime is sensualized. Immorality is popularized. Drugs are legitimized. Sin is glamorized. The courts are paralyzed. The breakup of the family is rationalized. And normalized manners are uncivilized christians are demonized and god is marginalized no wonder people don't have any hope so hope i need to clarify define and we're going to get into this passage in hebrews to talk about it hope is not optimism some of you are natural born optimists some of you are see the glass half full some of you are pessimists that's that's not what hope is biblical hope biblical hope is theological Optimism is psychological. It's the mindset that you have. Optimism works in things that you can control to some degree, but hope for a follower of Jesus is trusting in God's promise based on his word and his track record. If you've had a rough year, you're like, I need hope today. I want to give you some hope, but not cheap hope. There's three types of hope that I'll define, and there's one that we're just going to lean on. First one is fool's hope. This is like um, the lottery type of hope. How many of you have bought the lottery ticket and been at the place in your life where you're like, you know what, I'm going to pray <laughs> for this lottery ticket. And don't even be like, well, I've never done that, Pastor. I will confess, I've done it. I've straight up seen that Powerball and it's like whatever, 200, 300 million. I was like, you know what, I got two bucks. I'll just buy one. And I would never confess this out loud to the people in Publix. You know, but I'd be walking out saying, Lord. You wouldn't believe how much I would give to the church if I won this. Lord, you couldn't. I would surprise you. <laughs> and you know what? I just realized right now, like there have been times where I've won like a buck, 10 bucks, 100 bucks. I don't think I've ever given that. I think the Lord was testing me to give me the big one. So I need to, Lord, I apologize. <laughs> And if you're an old redneck person, pray for them pygmy warriors down there in New Guinea. Yeah, that's, that's not the type of hope the Bible talks about. It's a fool's hope. It's a wishful thinking. That's the thinking when you're running late for a meeting. You're like, I pray that every light turns green, Lord. And when they don't, you're like, why did you abandon me in my minute of need, Lord? That's fool's hope. Don't have that. Then there's reasonable hope. There's some basis for this in reality. Fool's hope is it's, it's statistically unlikely. Reasonable hope is that there's some basis in reality. Commonly in the Bible, we see images of seeds. Farmer plants a seed. Reasonable hope is that seed will grow into something. A tomato, a zucchini, whatever you planted. There is some evidence that what you did will most likely lead to something else. That's not the hope I'm talking about today. That's, that's reasonable hope. The hope I want to talk to about today is certain hope. It's biblical hope. It's not wishful thinking. It's not a fool's errand hope. It's not just expecting hope. It's the hope that we trust in what God has done and what God has said and what God has shown himself to do throughout history. And we're going to put our hope in his track record, not in our abilities, in his ability, not in our feeble attempts to control something. And hope and faith, they're, they're tied together. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. If you're here and you're low on hope, you're like, how do I get this certain hope? The object on which you place your hope is of utmost importance. Hope is a good thing for all humans, but hope in the God who created us is the ultimate need that we have to continue living day after day after day. These faith and hope things are interwoven together. But certain hope, 
certain hope we need to talk about. Not just, man, I really hope I go to heaven because I've been a good person. I really hope that I go to heaven because I've done enough things to help other people. See, the certain hope goes beyond that. It goes beyond just religion and it gets to the gospel, the good news. That our certain hope is placed on who Jesus is and what he did for you and for me. In Hebrews 6, 19 to 20, we get a little bit of a definition of this. We have seen this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is the type of hope the Bible authors again and again tell us to place, place our trust, our faith in, the type of hope that's anchored into Jesus, the type of hope that is sure and steadfast, I don't want an unsure hope. People will often tell me when I'm talking with someone new about Jesus, they'll say, well, I'm more of a, a facts or logic or science person. I don't do the whole faith thing. And I am very quick to remind everyone that I speak to that says I'm not a big faith person, that, that we all place faith in something. Every one of us do it every day, hundreds of times. Like I often tell people, I say, no one, not one of you tested your chair before you sat down. Not one of you was like, is it sturdy enough to hold me? You just looked at it and thought, it's held someone before. It's holding my neighbor. It'll probably hold me. Maybe one day to prove this point, I will saw a leg most of the way through on just one or two chairs to teach you from trusting a chair. See, the, the hope that we have in Jesus is sure, not because of what we do for him, but because of what he did for us. Because we look at the historical evidence. We look at the reasons behind all of the movements of history, the fact that the Romans knew how to kill people, the fact that there was an empty tomb and even the enemies of Jesus said, something happened, we can't find the body, the fact that he, Jesus appeared to people after he was crucified, and the fact that the people who saw him, their lives were so changed, they literally gave their lives because they believed and had so much hope in the person and work of Jesus. Now, if you made up a lie, if you're team Jesus, and you're like, well, he died, but let's still create this new crazy religion and let's make up these stories. That's not something that you give your life for in the end, not just you, but you and him and the next person, and the next person, and the next person. All of these people who saw Jesus radically life changed after he resurrected from the dead. You want to have a steadfast, sure hope, one that is built on something that is strong and foundational. You want to have a steadfast hope, a hope that doesn't give up. Man, I've had hope that is just hanging by a thread. I've walked with families whose hope was hanging by a thread. I've walked with families and I thought, I don't know how they have any hope left with the things that they've gone through. Whether it's a mother losing a child in miscarriage, the death of a child. I've seen marriages where I've walked in and I thought, there can't, there's no other way unless Jesus does a miracle. There, I don't see hope for this marriage. But the cool thing is that Jesus does miracles. There are many of you in this room, when I look at you, I see that's a miracle that Jesus did. It's a miracle that God would reunite or bring a child back or have some last minute provision or even let you endure great hardship, but have such a strong anchor in the midst of it that you inspire others. This idea of this anchor, a sure hope and a, a hope that is steadfast, that keeps on going, that doesn't stop, and you hold on to it even when the world is so dark, you say, there is still light somewhere even if I can't see it. And then this picture of an anchor I love because I love being on the water. But I, I go out on these little boats, okay? The boats I go out on are like three of that. Just, you know, maybe from that Christmas tree to me. It's a boat. Then I, I've been on a cruise ship before. Has anyone been on a cruise ship? These are huge mammer jammers. And it's not until you realize the scale, because like when I go out on a boat with Craig, who I think is back there praying over the littles today, we throw out the little anchor. It's like this big. Cool. And, um, and I realized I needed to go to the gym because when Craig brings younger men out on his boat, he makes us pull the anchor back up. Okay? And, I, and there are multiple times where I'm just pulling this anchor up. And the bay is not very deep, maybe 30 feet, 50 feet. If you're way out deep, it's like 90 feet. But I'm like pulling this anchor up, and I'm thinking, this is a little heavy. Uh, I want to show you guys... 
a picture of something. This is just the chain of some of the larger anchors in the world. Look at that chain. The human is there for scale, okay? That's a grown man. And he's standing on top of a chain that holds these anchors for these massive ships. Go to the next picture, the one with the anchor on it. That's a dude with the ladder standing on an anchor. And that's just one anchor of sometimes these ships have many anchors that plummet down. And the anchors serve a couple of purposes in our lives. One is, if you're a fisherman or you've been on any boat, you know. The fish are, the fish are only in so many spots out there. So you have your little fish radar. Beep, 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 it tells you fish are right there. So you throw your anchor out. And the anchor keeps the boat relatively in one circle place. Like the current will kind of pull you and lock you in so you can just fish the same spot. If you don't have your anchor, and if you've never been out on the, in the open ocean, I would encourage you to do this as a living exercise. If you want to see how fast currents actually move in the ocean, have a friend drive you about 10 miles off the coast, put a life vest on, and just jump in. And he'll anchor the boat, and we'll see how you float. You'd be amazed at how fast. And some of you are thinking, well... The current is not what I'm most worried about 10 miles out in the ocean. You guys, sharks don't want to eat you, and if they do, they're all around you anyways. You'd already be a goner, okay? So just float. And it's incredible the speed at which the current will move you if you're not anchored. So it depends on what hope you're anchoring into. Because the other thing that an anchor does is that if you anchor your boat down with a strong enough anchor, when a storm comes... Your boat is reduced in the amount that it tosses and turns because you can anchor your boat in these points and your boat won't be capsized over. Your boat won't flip when a difficult time comes. But so often I see so many people, church-going people, non-church-going people, all people, they anchor into something that when a storm comes, their boat just gets hammered. And they're saying, what is going on? Why does it seem so out of control? Because we have placed our hope in lesser things. We've placed our hope in thin chains, breakable chains, with weak anchors that can't hold to the rock. And the whole purpose of the author of Hebrews saying the type of hope we need is a hope that is sure, a hope that is steadfast, and a hope that anchors our soul to something specific. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. What is that hope? Where Jesus has gone. If you want to be able to find hope in the midst of difficulty, no matter where you are today, no matter how desperate your situation is today, it always starts and works all the way through and ends with the person of Jesus. Thank you. That is why we have at least two Baptists here. Just for you to preach. Thanks. That's why we have one non-denominational camera operator. <laughs> Just sign up. We don't say amen. When the Spirit comes upon us, our hands go here, but never here. So here's what you do. You put your hope not in what you feel. You don't put your hope in the lottery and your investment and your marriage. You put your hope not in what you feel. You put your hope in what God has revealed. Put your hope not in a wish. I wish this happened. I hope this, look, I hope this happens. This weird miracle, green lights, lottery ticket. Lord, I hope that when I get home today, my wife will be a different person. My husband will be a different person. My kids will just want to love me and not reject me. No, no, put your hope not just in wishful thinking, but put your hope in what the Word of God actually says. I, I googled a bunch, and there's a bunch of trash on the internet about what causes people to give up hope. And, but here's ones that I thought, man, these, these ones I think are pretty distilled and legit, at least for me. I've lost hope because of many of these things on this list. When you feel alone or abandoned, the time that I came close to wanting to go be with Jesus was when I was abandoned. Abandoned by friends, abandoned by anyone that I thought should be there that wasn't there, and I just wanted to die. And it's a, it's a period of my life where I, I tried to run in a desolate place and let asthma take me home to Jesus. And it was the first day of my life where God said, oh, you're going to try to use asthma to end your life? I'm just going to let you run for as long as you want. And I was screaming, and people that were riding their bikes on a trail nearby thought, that guy's crazy. And I was like, Lord, why aren't you letting me wheeze to death? <laughs> you know, because I felt alone and abandoned. You might 
give up hope because life seems out of control. You might have this thought, it's never going to change. You might have this thought with a, a million things. Your promotion, your lack of promotion, the place that you live, the place that you don't live, the person you're with, the kids you have. You just think this is never going to change. And all of a sudden that just, it's like a, one of those cheese slicers that just takes a little bit of hope off the top over and over. You might lose hope because you don't see a purpose in your life. You know, people I've seen can handle so much. Humans are very resilient creatures. We're made in the image of God. We have this weird, cool, incredible, divine imprint of God on our lives. And I've seen humans handle quite a bit of intense things in my time as a pastor. But what I, I don't see often is when people don't have a purpose. They don't have any why for their life. How quickly that can cause someone to spiral. People can lose hope or want to give up hope when they're grieving, a loss. People can potentially give up hope when you don't have what you, what you want or need. Enough money, enough talents, enough time. That old saying, you're always a day late and a dollar short. Some people give up hope or lose hope when they've done something wrong. Guilt crushes down. It causes them to have no hope for restoration, no hope for freedom. This one I probably find most often in the chapel family and in church families over the past 20 years, that, that people allow guilt to crush them down. And as a, as a religious people, we're all wired to be religious of some way, to believe in something, to hope in something. When we hope in anything besides the absolute 100% love of Christ for us, what we do is we take that guilt off the cross. We take that shame off the cross. We say, I just want to wear this. And when you wear that, it will grind you down. I went to do squats this week with my brother. Do you guys know what squats are? It's this weight. It's this exercise thing, okay? I told my wife I'm trying to look like Thor for my birthday, and it's not going to work, just in case you were wondering. Yeah, I know some of you are already thinking, well, you're halfway there. Yeah, I'm halfway to Thor at the end of Infinity War, okay? That's the Thor, <laughs> Thor part four. No. So I'm working out with my brother. He's, he's giving me these tips, and we're doing this squat thing. Now, he is a pure workout person, okay? And, uh, and he... I was like, I, I don't know how to do squats. I'm not built for squats. Like, dude, you're 5'8", and you're flexible. I'm 6'6", six, six, and I'm as flexible as plywood, okay? So I told him, I'm going to use this machine over here. Don't, if you're a weightlifter, don't grunt at me. It's called the Smith machine, okay? It's a cheating machine, allegedly, because the bar is on a track, so you can't move the bar around. He wanted me to be pure, just put the steel bar on my little baby back muscles and then squat down and be like, <laughs> you know, but I needed a machine. And he said, you can't use that machine, you're with me. And I said, bet I can't. <laughs> so I go on the machine, I was like, this really hurts my back. And I said, hey, Trent, don't they have one of those pads here? You know, the pads you put on the bar for baby little shoulders like mine? He goes, dude, you cannot use the pad, you're with me. I said, bet I can't. So I'm looking around, I find the pad, I put it on. It's just a pillow of heavenly comfort. I go on the squat rack cheat machine with my pad on. And he's like, I'm not with you. I first squat down with like nothing on the bars, like I think 25s or 45s at that point. I'm like, that's my brother over there. His name is Trent. He's my trainer. <laughs> and I kept going on this machine. And he was like, it's not me. I don't know him, which he could get away with. We don't look alike. I got all the good looks and he got all the muscles. But needless to say, it's this, it's this idea of, of when, you've, when you've done something wrong and it crushes you down or when you feel abandoned and all these things, they're just going to press you down and press you down and press you down. And when I was doing these squats, I kept joking around in my brain because, see, I'm 6'6", six, six, and he's 5'8". And he's, when he says 5'8", it's like a, that's his driver's license height, okay? It's 5'8", driver's license height. And, uh, and I was talking to my son. He said, yeah, Daddy, don't do squats because isn't squats what makes you shorter? I said, oh, it does. Uncle Trent? And I, we were the same height <laughs> when we were kids, which is not true. That's a full-on lie. I was Trent's grown height when I was like in third grade, okay? But it is true that if you do these squats, it compresses your spine. It is true that when you, you lift weights, certain things don't work like they used to work, especially when you're just starting out. And if you if you overwork something, if you let something, if you let too much pressure get applied on you, eventually you can't walk. And I did not put this picture for this slide for you guys to see, but I did a leg day with my brother two days ago. My legs are on fire today. 
And there was one machine that we were doing. It's the machine where you do this. I'm just doing this for the gym people. That's it. The rest you can tune out until January 1st when you make a commitment to, that you'll fail. Yeah, okay. Yes, I'm doing that machine with the two legs. And I was like, okay, my brother benches more than me. My brother curls more than me. My brother does all the things more than me. But man, the Lord gave me some thighs. So when we get to that machine, whatever he puts the weight on, I'm going to go full send on this. He put the weight all the way at the bottom. And then he clicked this little thing that says, and just five more pounds more. I said, whatever he can lift with those dainty little short Oompa Loompa looking legs, I can lift. <laughs> so I go down, and when we're trading on machines, he's short, so he's got to put the seat all the way up. And then when I get on, I put it all the way back. And I did it. I was like, yeah. we were doing that scene from, remember the Titans? Strong side, too strong. And everyone in the gym's looking at us, okay? Because they, they don't know. Because he looks very black and I look very Asian, okay? So they're looking at us like, are those guys, is this like a movie? Th what's going on? They're too strong. And then I get up from this machine after about our third or fourth set of doing max weight, five pound down. And I go to stand up. And all of this part of me had turned from human into grape jello. And I just fell on the ground. M middle of the floor. Just laid there. And I... It looks like one of those scenes, like from a homicide movie. And my brother, without missing a beat, takes out his camera before saying anything. <laughs> sends it to Bree, one of our workout crew, you know. And I'm like, how did I even let this happen to me? The girl who was working the front desk literally did one of these over me. Just kept walking. I said, that's all? I just met you today, front desk lady. And she goes, it's my last day. You won't remember me. You're right, I won't. <laughs> but what happened was I, I, was trying to, I was trying to bear too much on my own. I was trying to do this isolated from actual help. I didn't want to listen to my brother who actually knows what he's doing with some weight things. I, I just wanted to, I could do this on my own. I could hold this weight on my own. The reason that so many of us fall into hopelessness is because we try to manage our aloneness on our own. We try to manage it when life seems out of control. We try to control it. When we're grieving a loss, we try to internalize it. When we don't have what we need, we try to scrape for what we need. When we've done something wrong, we try to bear the guilt thinking that if we bear it long enough, it will finally leave us alone. When we're deeply wounded by somebody, when we're abused or hurt so bad that you can't think of anything else, and we try to stuff it down and bear it alone, what we are doing is we are putting more weight on our soul than our soul was designed to bear because our soul was not designed to bear things alone. And we do this in our culture. We shrink our front porches and we go there seldom and we expand our backyards where we can be alone. And God says, I've got someone that bears a burden, whose shoulders are wider, whose, whose strength is greater, and you don't want to just give this over. The reason why we fall out of hope and fall into hopelessness is because we feel powerless sometimes to break through. Lord, what can I do? The answer is nothing. But what's been done for you? The answer is everything. Sometimes we feel hopeless because we're trying to bear all of this weight of all of these things, and we're so scared that if we gave control over to Jesus, he might ask us to do something crazy. It's incredible to me, the, the free gift of Jesus that we talk about this Christmas season, but it's been so twisted by religion. You come to Jesus, now what? Well, now you got to do this and do this and do that. This Christmas season, I want us to just do hope in him. Hope that is sure. Hope that is steadfast. Hope that is anchored to weather great storms. This Christmas season, we're going to go through the ghosts of hope, the hope of Christmas past and future and present. I want us to be thinking in our own lives, where do I need hope? Where am I not trusting Jesus? Because here's reasons why you can hope. If you're like, okay, Pastor Ryan, I'm here. I'm hopeless. What do I do? Here's some antidotes. They're all going to be rooted in this name up here, by the way. When you feel alone, remember that your loving Father will never, ever, ever abandon you. When life seems out of control, remember that there has never been a moment in the history of the world, in the farthest reaches of any galaxy, where God has not been in control. 
as Abraham Kuyper said, and I love this quote, there is not one square inch on planet earth over which the risen Christ does not say, mine, and I own it, and I rule it. Remember when life is out of control, that Jesus was never out of control. Remember when you're confused and without purpose, that God fits everything, every single thing into his plan, an eternal plan, and it might suck. Sorry, that's not the churchy word. Because I don't have the answers. When parents have lost children, they say, how does this fit into God's plan? I don't know. When people have some marriage dissolve, when people lose their job, when people lose a limb, when people lose their vision, and they say, how does this fit into God's plan? I say, I don't know all these things. You're asking me to tell you how a cosmic, eternal, omnip omnipotent, all-powerful being operates. I almost didn't graduate high school. I can read the book, and I can show you that over and over again, when bad things happen, when terrible things happen, God is weaving it together for the purpose of highlighting how good he is and how much he loves his children. Well, it doesn't feel like love, what God did to me last year, 2020. I don't feel like love. You know what? I could tell you from experience, and many of you can, if you've lived more than like six months, that if, when you've gone through something, isn't it crazy how often God brings people into your circle who, who begin then going through that same thing or something very similar, and all of a sudden, you're like, I actually know how to talk to this person. You're like, yeah, that does seem to happen a lot. Maybe that's a coincidence that happens over, and if you could have seen the number of heads that just nodded when I said that. It was basically everyone here that's like 10 days from Social Security. They're like, yeah, we got that. Gotcha. Got that. I've done it all the time. So maybe God led you through that because he knows someone else is going through it because this world is broken because there are reasons to fall into hopelessness if you don't have the hope of the world. When you feel, when you're grieving, remember that God has a greater purpose for your life and that Jesus himself grieved when his friend died. It says Jesus wept. Jesus cried right before he resurrected a dude from the dead. If I had that power at a funeral that I've done, pick a funeral, any funeral, I don't think I could cry. If I knew I was about to bop someone out like a whack-a-mole, I'd be like, they're in my suit. It's the suit that if you see me in, you're dead or you're getting married, okay? That suit. And if I knew I'm about to bust this dude out of here, I'd be like, take heart, young child. Bazinga, you know? And I don't know how, but he's got, Jesus has such compassion. He's with us when we grieve. He grieves with us. He grieves alongside us. He's not me. I would have lasered people from the cross with Superman beams, and I would be raising people from the dead and just smiling goofy. But he's a good God. I'm a stupid kid. If you feel guilty and you've lost hope because of guilt pressing you down, crushing your legs, remember that Jesus died to pay for all, all that you've done wrong, all that you have done are doing, will do. I don't know how many times I say this, but still people don't believe me. The reason I know is because I speak to you and I listen to you. It is so easy for us to just hold on to a little piece of our mistakes. I need you to let them go. I need you to let them go and be so free that you say, when someone says, I can't believe you do that, then you say, you can't believe that. You better believe it because Jesus died for it. You can't believe that I do that sin. You don't even know how much God loves me the amount of love and forgiveness and hope that God pours in to all of your mistakes is infinitely more than you can imagine. So when you mess up, I'm just clapping, saying, I can't believe Jesus loves you that much. I can't believe Jesus loves you that much, Don. I can't believe it. I can't believe, Derek, how much Jesus loves you. I can't believe, Angel, how much Jesus loves you. He must love you so much. Because if I just took the four of us that I just mentioned, and one of us is named Angel, the amount of sin that we have, if you could quantify it into pennies, would burst out of this building. Just the one of us. And God says, I see that. And I've forgiven every one of those moments, every one of those thoughts. And religious people, we can't even get rid of it. We're so addicted to our achievements and just clam ourselves up. We can't let go of these things. If you're feeling hopeless because about what you've done, you have forgotten what Jesus did for you. 
Don't forget, you guys, remember, remember. All of these antidotes for hopelessness are remember what Jesus did. When you've been hurt, remember that God is a just God. Remember, when you feel powerless to break through temptations, remember that God has promised to help. He said, I will help you bear under these great temptations. I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. When you feel afraid or frightened and that's causing you to feel hopeless, there's no way out. Remember that Jesus in me is greater than any other power anywhere in the world. I was talking with my kids and sort of end with this, the power of Jesus for hope. And it's going to come from a not very <laughs> good illustration. So I teach my kids curse words in tiers, okay? There's tier three, tier two, tier one, and then the no-no zone up there, okay? Tier two, it's the A word, the dog word. There's tier three. Tier two is the SH word, not sh, but the other part too. Um, and some other words, tier one, just the F word, the one like we don't want. And then for me, I said, I've told all my kids, most of my boys, I would rather you say all of these words than use the name of Jesus as a cuss word. Okay? Right? But then I've been thinking about this. See, all the religious people said, that's right. That's right, pastor. You know that's right. It's crazy to me that the, the name of our beloved, compassionate, beacon of hope Savior is on the tongues of unbelievers more than believers. It's weird to me because we don't stub our toes as often as they do. And they stub their toe. Oh! And they say his name. And I, I was, I just, it perplexed me. Like, why is this happening? You want to know Why? Do you want to know why people say the name of Jesus or the name of God when they stub their toe, when life goes bad? Because here's what cursing is in general. You want to take the word that carries with it the largest bag of power and authority, which is why when you get really mad, you, you all know you have some words. I don't know what they are, and as a good pastor, I never say them. But you say them. I don't know what they are. And here's the amazing thing. I actually started smiling because it's weird that I hear it in the gym now. Like people get hurt in the gym or people get off the treadmill after they've been running for a long time and they'll get off the treadmill and they'll say, oh, Jesus. And I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because inherently, subconsciously, not knowing because we are made in the image of God, they are evoking what is the most powerful name in all of history. And they know, whether they know it in their knower or it's just somewhere in their soul, that the most powerful word that carries more authority in our culture is the name of Jesus, even though they don't go on any Sunday to anywhere. It, it carries more power and authority and viscerality than the F word or the SH word or any other word that you think is a bad word. Which is why people say it, because there's power in the name of Jesus. And they don't even understand it. And we do, and we walk around acting powerless when we are not. So if you want hope, go to the person. If you want that sure, steadfast, anchored hope, it's a person. It's not an idea. It's not just a theological concept. It's a person who went behind the curtain and said, you guys can't come back here by yourselves, but I'm going to rip the curtain wide open so you can be with God forever. It's the curtain that says all of the sin that could never breach this barrier, I've taken that sin on. Every ounce of it you've ever spit out of your mouth. So now you can walk back here freely before God. If you want hope from all of these areas of life, I encourage you to continue to tune in because we're going to dig into different aspects of hope in the Bible. Not a fool's hope, not even a reasonable hope, but how we can grow in the certain hope who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Christmas. I thank you that you were born for me, for us, that you lived perfect for us, that you died for us. Lord, the hopelessness is so staggering right now in our culture. Lord, we're dying for hope. Help us as your people to live in the midst of the deepest ocean of hope that is. To put aside these little things that we have wishful thinking for and step in to you. Where all hope is found. The anchor, the source who will hold us in every storm, carry us 
through every valley and be with us in the darkest nights of our souls. Help us to have a hope that isn't just for the happy days, but it's for the most tragic days we will live through. A hope that helps us to find your strength, your love, your forgiveness when we need it most. In Jesus' name, all God's kids said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Chapel family. How's everybody doing this morning? I say that every time. How's everybody doing this morning? It's like three or four people. How is the family that's here at the chapel in the building doing this morning? Yeah. All right, now everybody be really quiet. Everybody at home, how are you doing this morning? There you go. You heard it, right? Like, like you're pinging in there. Well, I'm excited. Christmas is my favorite time of year. The fam fam is already doing it up with their, their uh, plaid. You know what? Look. What? We match. We match. Awesome. Christmas is my favorite time. Here at the chapel, Christmas. Yeah, whatever, dude. I'm not a sports guy, so I can say that about every team, so whatever, dude. Uh, no, uh, we got Christmas Eve service right here at the chapel coming up in a few weeks. We want to invite everybody out. We're going to do one service this week, or this year, and we're going to pack this place out. So if you're uh, big about coming out on Christmas Eve, 6 o'clock right here at the chapel, we're going to be doing that. So we're going to welcome all you guys that. Coming up in two weeks, we have our... 2020 annual business meeting. So what this is, is uh, uh, where we join together as a chapel family. We talk about the past year, the budget, and we talk about what we're going to be doing in the next year. So if you consider yourself a chapel family member, whether we don't have like membership or anything like that, but if you want to find out what's Dude, going on. We have on, membership. It's called baptism. That's salvation. That's true. Attendance. We're members of the body of Christ. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So if you guys want me to come up with a little cultic thing that you have to sign and commit to something, I'll do that <laughs> for you. But if you want to just do what the Bible says, I'd rather just do that. Go on. Anywho, so uh, two weeks, Sunday, December 27th, following right after the service right here in the room. If you just have questions about what's going on in the background of the chapel uh, with the finances, what we got planned for 2020, you guys are welcome to do that. It's going to be a really quick meeting, no more than 30 minutes to go over the stuff. In you know why thing. I picked the 27th, right? Because everyone's on vacation, well. and it's the easiest way for me to sneak in a raise. But hey. I just sneak it in. Get a couple friends here. Be like, you guys want to vote? I'll vote. Let's vote. You gotta no, I'm just kidding. Oh, you got to sneak a I'll sneak, I'll sneak a demotion in if I need to. <laughs> so let's go ahead and stand to our feet this yeah. morning. On the way out, uh, Don is going to be uh, accepting our offering. We, uh, you know, thank you guys for, as a chapel family, for your giving. We do have some pretty substantial bills that are due right now. and We've fallen behind a little bit. Not afraid. Um, but we trust in God knowing that he's going to provide for it. So uh, that's it. Pastor Ryan, you want to dismiss us? Do you love your wife? More than you know. Is Edwin healed and okay? More than you know. Did I see a young couple make me uncomfortable with the way they kissed each other this morning? More than you know. <laughs> God's going to do amazing things in Are all of us. Are they married? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right. That's I'm not right. going to tell you guys who it was. <laughs> no. I'm, in, I'm trying to encourage married people to make out more. It's a biblical thing. Not now. Not now. No one wants to see Moses from Charlton Heston making out with a human, okay? <laughs> May the God of Christmas, the God of all hope, put a banner over your life this week when hopelessness creeps in to say, I'm your anchor, don't fear. I'm your anchor, never give up. And may Jesus the King be the constant name on the tip of your tongue in the positive way. And may the Holy Spirit of God give you the, the strength, the fortitude, the remembrance to cast away these things that would seek to crush and tear your soul down and plant you firmly in Jesus on the cross. God be with you. Have an amazing week.